As I mentioned after our notes with World War I, um, that the conditions that were created under the Treaty of Versailles made it so that when the Great Depression hits the entire world, that it leads to a situation in which Hitler is able to seize power. And ultimately, those things are what leads us into World War II. But in the 1930s, the United States isn't really concerned with foreign affairs. We're in the throes of the Great Depression, um, and so we're not super concerned about things that are happening outside of the U.S. FDR specifically is number one concerned with what's going on inside the United States. FDR also has a new vision for foreign policy. Um, unlike previous presidents, he recognized the Soviet Union as a country and opened up diploma diplomacy um, between the United States and the Soviet Union. He also started a new policy towards Latin America that was known as the good neighbor policy. And basically what the good neighbor policy said was that we were going to remove our right to intervene militarily. If there were a, was a country where we had troops, we withdrew them, recognized their sovereignty. But we also took steps to counter any other influence, especially German influence in Latin America by expanding trade to Latin America and also promoting American culture in Latin American countries. This is part of the reason why you have the Federal Theater Project traveling to Latin American countries and putting on shows. At the same time, Japan is expanding. Um, Japan underwent a massive industrialization program after opening trade with the United States in the 1850s, and they start to take over areas that were not previously theirs, like Manchuria or Nanjing in China. Germany is also expanding under Hitler. Um, first, they move into the Rhineland. Um, they are helping uh, General Franco, who is um, in the midst of a civil war in Spain. Franco was the fascist. Um, he also annexes Austria and Czechoslovakia. At the same time, he's accelerating a campaign against German Jews. And so people are aware of what Hitler is doing. And the European powers often chose this policy of appeasement in dealing with Hitler's aggressions. Um, rather, they were basically trying to avoid war. So basically what the, the system of appeasement would be um, was that, okay, Hitler, we're going to let you have Austria, but no more. And then uh, Hitler would move into Czechoslovakia and the appeasement policy would say, okay, you can have this, but no more. Um, so it was basically a system where we were allowing Hitler to have these small things in hopes that he wouldn't continue trying to gain more. Um, as all of this is going on, of course, in the United States, we're very much aware of what's going on. But most people in the U.S. really didn't want to get involved. In fact, a lot of people in the United States kind of liked Hitler um, and liked the things that he was doing in Germany. We also continued to have open trade with Japan. Um, many people in the United States were felt or they were feeling like World War I was a mistake. And so this um, sentiment of isolationism dominated Congress. You see the passage of several neutrality acts where we ban travel um, on belligerent ships. So if, you know, because Britain was at war, we couldn't travel or if Germany is at war, then we couldn't travel on German ships, um, wouldn't sell uh, military equipment or arms to any belligerent nation or a nation that's at war. Um, we also did not get involved in the civil war that was going on in Spain. We did not help the democratic government that was in Spain fighting General Franco. Um, in September, though, September 1st of 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Um, and so this is the point where like Great Britain and France say, okay, that's enough. So Britain and France declared, um, declared war. Um, 
Germany used a similar strategy that they had used previously, the um, trying to get in and take over France as quickly as possible so that they didn't have to fight a two-front war. Um, they used a system that was known as Blitzkrieg, which means lightning war in German. And German Blitzkrieg under Hitler was completely unstoppable. They took Poland almost immediately, Scandinavia, Belgium, the Netherlands, Paris was taken, all of these, these countries taken over by Germany by June of 1940. So less than a year, all of these, most of Europe and North Africa um, in less than one year. At that point, Great Britain is the last man standing. They are the only country that is left. In September of 1940, um, Germany, Italy, and Japan joined together in a military alliance known as the Axis Powers. Um, after you know, Hitler has taken over most of Europe and North Africa, they set their sights on Britain. And what ensues is called the Battle of Britain, which was basically the German Air Force Take, um, go flying over England, specifically London and some other major cities, and just dropping a ton of bombs. Um, you can see from this picture um, on this slide, this is a picture. You can see the Tower Bridge um, in London, and you can see all of the smoke and everything from the bombings that were happening. Now, back here in the United States, Roosevelt certainly viewed Hitler as a threat, but he was really reluctant to do much more um, because 1940 is an election year and he's running for an unprecedented third term. And so he's very much concerned about making any kind of moves to prevent him from winning um, his third term. Um, so in 1940, he adopts this policy of cash and carry um, for Great Britain. So basically what the cash and carry policy does is it goes back on those neutral neutrality acts and it says that we will um, sell arms to belligerent nations, this nation that we're talking about specifically being Great Britain, and we will sell them um, any kind of military needs that they have, any kind of arms, weapons, whatever, we will sell that to them as long as they pay for it up front so there's no loans and that they take it themselves. So they come and pick that in, that, those things up that they need and they ship it back to Great Britain themselves. So if you pay cash and you can carry it yourself, we will sell you military items. So he runs for re-election. Again, it's an unprecedented third term. And he kind of runs on this campaign of the situation abroad and here in the United States is too fragile. And it's, this isn't the, the time where someone else can kind of come in and deal with these things. I've been in this for the last eight years. You need to stick with me because I understand what's going on and it's gonna be best for everyone. Um, throughout 1940, it gets closer and we get closer and closer and closer to fighting. Britain goes bankrupt at a certain point in 1940. They're not able to pay for arms. And so then uh, Roosevelt is able to get Congress to pass the Lend-Lease Act, which authorized military aid as long as um, whatever country was using it returned it following the war. So this specifically pertained to Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union. At the same time with the Lend-Lease Act, we froze any Japanese assets that were here in the United States. Um, in the early part of this war, the reason why the Soviet Union is not involved is because Hitler and Stalin had a non-aggression pact. And um, in 1940, Hitler renounced the non-aggression pact and invaded the Soviet Union. So as this war is continuing on, it's, a, it's being increasingly described as an ideological struggle between dictator and the free world. And then everything changes on December 7th of 1941. Um, on that day, Hitler then, and Roosevelt famously says that it's a day that will live in infamy, Japanese planes bombed Pearl Harbor, which was a military outpost in Hawaii, um, and it was a, a complete surprise attack. They attacked in the, the Japanese attacked in the morning. 2,000 Americans were killed. 187 aircraft were destroyed. 18 naval vessels, including eight battleships, were destroyed or damaged. Luckily, absolutely no aircraft carriers 
were destroyed. That was incredibly lucky because it allowed us um, to be able to launch our war in the Pacific. Um, after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt goes to Congress and asks Congress to declare war. Um, the U.S. gives that war declaration, and on December 8th, Germany declared war on the United States. The first few months of this war was, uh, was basically a military disaster for the United States. We had very little success in the opening months of the war for us. Japan overtook many Asian countries, colonies, islands, places like French Indochina, Burma, Siam, the Dutch East Indies, Guam, the Philippines. There was a, a really terrible and large U.S. surrender in the Philippines, because remember, the Philippines is a U.S. holding at this point in time. Um, it was called the Bataan Death March. German subs were sink sinking Allied merchant vessels in the Atlantic. Um, the tide does not start to turn until May of 1942 at the Battle of the Coral Sea. Um, at the Battle of the Coral Sea, um, we are able to turn back the Japanese fleet um, that was looking to take over Australia. So you can see in uh, this map of the Pacific Theater, um, the Cor Battle of the Coral Sea is happening right here. Um, and you can see that the Japanese were pushing as far as they could. They, they ultimately wanted to take over Australia and have this massive empire in the Pacific. This red line is the extent of the um, Japanese uh, empire as they were taking over this red line. Um, so Battle of Coral Sea, we were able to turn back the Japanese fleet that was looking to take Australia. Uh, by June, we have some losses to the Japanese Navy in the Battle of the Midway, but we start the strategy of island hopping. And it means that, you know, we're not necessarily going to try to take over every single island that the Japanese have taken, but if we can hit strategic islands along the way, um, and you can see kind of where these major battles are. Uh, if we hit strategic islands that cut off the Japanese military, then we can ultimately take over more with less work on our part. Um, on the European front, um, in November of 1942, British and American forces invaded North Africa. By May of 1943, we were able to force the surrender of the Germans. We also started to gain the upper hand in the Atlantic over the German sub-fleet in, um, in 1942 and 1943. But as you can see, our, you know, these are our first entrees into, um, into the war in Europe. Um, we're not really doing anything there. You know, the U.S. doesn't immediately start fighting in Europe, and really most of what the United States was doing was gearing up for a large-scale invasion of Europe. And that large-scale invasion um, happens on June 6th of 1944, and we know that, uh, that invasion as D-Day. Um, and it was our large-scale, um, it was British, U.S. Canadian troops that invaded Europe. Over 200,000 men landed in Normandy in France, which is the, the northern part of France. You can see that um, on this map right here. Here is, this is the area of Normandy. This is where all of the beaches were um, when we invaded. Um, a million troops followed after that initial 200,000. This was the largest sea land military operation in history. By August of 1944, we were able to liberate Paris. There's also fighting going on on the Eastern Front between Germany and the Soviet Union. A 1941 invasion led to the uh, August 1942 siege on Stalingrad, which was deep inside Russia. Um, the supplies from the United States uh, into the Soviet Union actually led the Germans to uh, be surrounded and they were forced to surrender. Um, 800,000 Germans died at the Battle of Stalingrad. 1.2 million Russians died. Um, that battle was the turning point in the war 
in Europe. Of the 13.6 million German casualties, 10 million were on the Russian front alone. Um, millions of Poles, at least 20 million Russians died, not just soldiers, civilians died from starvation, disease, massacres. Um, the eastward movement of Hitler led to his final solution or the mass extermination of undesirables. It wasn't just Jews that Hitler was after. It was um, people of Slavic descent, um, gypsies, homosexuals. By 1945, six million Jewish men, women, and children died in Nazi death camps. Um, this was the Holocaust, right? Um, it's the, the Holocaust was the culmination of the Nazi belief in German superiority. It was not always um, to kill, right? Um, initially, it was just to remove, but as, um, as Hitler was becoming more and more successful in those early years of the war that led him to shift that policy. Um, he became more confident in his ability to do these certain things to these, these different groups. Um, and so that's important to know that that wasn't what the plan was all along. Not that any part of the plan was good, um, but that you know he initially just wants removal and it eventually, through all of his success, turns into the Holocaust that we understand today.